Morning, everybody. Welcome. Good to see people who have been on before and new people. I'm, I'm Neva Spake and I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, we've been doing these Zoomers since last summer um, and uh, we're really um, happy today to have with us Jessica Martell, who is a professor in um, the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies, also teaches in Watauga Residential College and um, has an affiliate mem um, faculty membership in um, Appalachian Studies. And then um, Dr. Zach Vernon, who is professor in the English department. So um, I'm gonna let them uh, introduce themselves a bit more and tell you what they're gonna be talking about today. And when they're finished, um, we will open it up for question and answers. But if you think of something during their talk and you wanna get it out there, just go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, and at the end, um, they can either take uh, questions in the chat or you can raise your hand, and they can call on you. Um, but I hope you enjoy. Um, Jessica and Zach, take it over. Okay, um, well, thank you so much. Um, it's lovely to see everybody. I see some familiar faces, um, former students um, and fellow faculty. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this event today. Um, I first wanna uh, thank Ellen Burnett, um, Carrie Fassell, and Eva Spake for the invitation to give this talk today on contested cuisines in the South. Um, and I'd also like thank, to thank everybody um, out there for watching. So I'm gonna try to share my screen really quickly. Okay, can everybody see that? All right, excellent. So as Dr. Spake said, my name is um, Zachary Vernon. I'm an associate professor in the English department here at Appalachian State University. And as you'll see today, my research focuses primarily on Southern and Appalachian cultures. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about one of the most intense um, controversies in recent years surrounding American foodways which resulted from an article by Hillary Dixler Canavan published in March of 2016 on the food centric uh, website eater.com. Okay, so Canavan's article entitled um, How Gullah Cuisine Has Transformed Charleston Dining, Exploring the Line Between Shared History and Appropriation examines how and why Charleston, South Carolina has become one of the best culinary destinations in the United States with its restaurants and restaurateurs winning an array of prestigious awards. The city has also been featured on many TV shows, including Anthony Bourdain's two shows, No Reservations and Parts Unknown, as well as The Mind of a Chef, Top Chef, Chef's Table, and Padma Lakshmi's Taste the Nation. In the eater.com article, Canavan takes Charleston's food scene to task because of its lack of diversity. The city's culinary accolades, for example, are rarely, if ever, given to people of color. This becomes particularly alarming when one realizes how many of Charleston's culinary traditions are derived from African American and, more specifically, Gullah Geechee foodways. According to Canavan, these culinary traditions were brought with enslaved individuals from West Africa to South Carolina and have been maintained amongst the Gullah Geechee people who are direct descendants of those enslaved individuals. Canavan suggests that the Charleston food scene is part of the latest culinary craze to locate authentic cuisines. And she argues that this has inspired white male chefs to serve up purportedly traditional foods. This in and of itself can be annoying um, those who charge exorbitant prices for faux folksy food on cutesy vintage plates. However, this becomes especially problematic if that same food was actually invented and prepared first by enslaved individuals and then domestic workers and finally by economically disadvantaged cooks, almost all of whom were African American. So chefs, usually white and male in fancy downtown restaurants in Charleston and across the South are often preparing historically black food and then profiting from that food, which is understood by diners to be an authentic representation of the region. Um, and some of these dishes include, 
um, according to Canavan, crab rice, conch stew, okra soup, head on fried whiting, and purlu. Um, and Canavan asserts, Conversations about the subject often focus on the idea of cooking with local historically accurate ingredients, as opposed to the fact that slavery was the genesis for said ingredients arriving and thriving in the South. That white people appropriate black culture and cash in on it without giving credit where credit is due comes as no surprise to me. Such insidious forms of appropriation have long existed in the South with everything from music to fashion to food. But Canavan's claims did surprise and enrage some. Immediately following the publication of her article, various social media platforms exploded with vitriolic commentary and people, mostly white people, tried to discredit Canavan and her argument. African-American food historian Michael Twitty says, quote, I've noticed that only certain people get pissed off over this appropriation conversation, and it's usually the people who make money off the transaction of selling the culture. Um, I would expand Twitty's account of the situation slightly. I think white people, regardless of whether they benefit directly from white chefs hawking of black food, are frustrated by this controversy because it problematizes what they are desperate to believe is a return to cultural authenticity in a postmodern world seemingly plagued by inauthentic, homogenized, globalized culture. But regardless of motivation, we can say with certainty that white people are upset because their supposed cultural saviors are actually resurrecting a culture, not their own, and selling it without acknowledging or paying the originators of that culture, namely African-Americans. The chef most routinely called out for the appropriation of African-American culinary traditions is Sean Brock, the two-time James Beard award-winning chef who created Charleston's much celebrated restaurants, Husk and McCready's. In the wake of the eater.com article, Michael Twitty um, wrote an open letter to Brock stating, quote, I insist on my right of return as the descendant of Charleston's enslaved and of the rice growers that gave the low country a story to sell. The South shall rise again, but will African-Americans. We need economic development, food justice, and most of all, we refuse to be put at the periphery of our narrative when we should remain at its center. This isn't technically your responsibility, Sean Brock, but if part of our story is in your hands, so too must be part of a solution. So food writer John T. Edge um, also responded to Canavan's article in a piece in Oxford American that he co-authored with Nigerian-born chef Tunde Wei. This article, um, like Canavan, seeks to analyze white male power and privilege in the restaurant industry. Edge writes, um, at a moment when conversations about food have become central to the American dialogue about identity, the issues Canavan and Twitty raises about authenticity and ownership and appropriation will fester if they're not further explored. Edge goes on in the article to say, inquiries about power were primary. If I bought the argument embedded in the Eater article, if I acknowledge the inquiries and subjugations on which much of Southern cuisine was built, Tunde asks, was I willing to cede what whites have gained at the, at the expense of blacks? Am I willing now to cede what I have gained? I agree with Edge on the point that it is important to examine race and racism when exploring Southern foodways so as not to allow these difficult issues to fester more than they already have. However, as you'll see, See, I don't believe Edge does an adequate job examining these issues or his own position within them. Tunde Wei, in his portion of the essay, provides incisive commentary on the political nature of food and the way in which food-based identity is fraught if a dominant group appropriates the culture of a marginalized one. 
Way calls out Sean Brock as one of the most egregious cases of a white chef who, quote, unabashedly cooks black food. Furthermore, Way asserts that it is white privilege that would lead Brock to quarrel with an authority like Michael Twitty on the question of his appropriation of African-American cuisine. Um, in this article, um, Edge also, or Way also calls out Edge saying, um, white privilege permits a humble, folksy, and honest white boy, i.e. John T. Edge, to diligently study the canon of appropriated black food, then receive extensive um, celebration in magazines, newspaper, newspapers, and television programming for reviving the fortunes of Southern cuisine. More pointedly, Way asks, um, you're a graceful man, John T. So what will you willingly give up to ensure the Southern food narrative services properly and fully the contributions of black Southerners. At first glance, this exchange seems open and genuine and perhaps even meaningful. Edge does acknowledge that for much of our region's history, blacks and women did much of the conceptual work and physical labor in the region's kitchens, but received niggling credit. However, Edge does not ever satisfactorily answer his own questions or those of Way. In the conclusion of the article, he simply states, quote, still, I know this about myself. I'm not willing to step away. I'm not able. What I can offer rings meager even to me. I aim to listen more and speak less. I pledge to cede what is not mine and try to understand the difference. This non-response response becomes additionally vexing when considered in light of a more recent controversy. Last year, several women and people of color asked Edge to step down as director of the Southern Foodways Alliance at the University of Mississippi. Tunde Wei um, was among those who called for Edge to cede his position. The writer Nicole Taylor is quoted in a New York Times article about the controversy saying, when you look at the history of the Southern Foodways Alliance, it's built on black stories and there's not one black person in a position of power. As we saw before from Edge, he offered an unsatisfying response when asked by the New York Times about his possible resignation. Um, he said, I want to embrace the critique. I intend to listen and I don't listen well enough and I'm still at it and I appreciate it. According to the New York Times plans to elevate the roles of two of its longstanding staff members, Melissa Booth Hall and Mary Beth Lassiter to positions of co-director on par with Mr. Edge are in development. But based on the current website for the Southern Foodways Alliance, I checked again today just to make sure this is true. Um, uh, Melissa Booth Hall is listed as managing director and Mary Beth Lassiter as associate director while Edge is listed as the founding director. So as of yet, little power it seems has been ceded. So what can we take away from these controversies? Um, first, we must consider who is in positions of power from executive chefs to center directors to magazine writers and how they were able to obtain those positions. It is not merely talent, but also privilege based on class, gender, and most importantly, race that enables people to climb the ladder. Another takeaway from this controversy is historical accuracy and honesty. White male chefs in particular need to acknowledge the fact that most of the South's ingredients and culinary traditions derive from black chefs and often black women. A final takeaway is economic. Historical accuracy must be coupled with opportunities for contemporary African-American culinarians to become executive chefs and restaurant owners. Part of this has to do with the recent so-called professionalization of restaurant kitchens wherein degrees from top culinary programs have become the norm to enable chefs to land high profile restaurant jobs or start their own kitchens. 
Access to this kind of education requires tremendous privilege in terms of time and money. In addition, economic barriers to starting restaurants reflect economic disparities more broadly that have historical links to slavery and subsequent racist lending practices and real estate owning patterns that perpetuate white wealth and prevent people of marginalized groups from entering the restaurant industry except at the lowest levels. These takeaways leave us with difficult but necessary questions. The solutions will not come easily given that these issues are based on large long-standing structural inequalities. The good news is that these controversies demonstrate that we're now at least having the conversation and having the conversation is the first step to righting these historical wrongs. So um, for the remainder of my time today and before I turn things over to our, our headliner, Dr. Martel, um, I'd like to address another facet of this controversy and one that is not discussed as often. Um, and this will bring us to our home region of Southern Appalachia. And this turn for good or ill also brings us back to Sean Brock. So while many of the critiques leveled against white male chefs like Brock are valid, as I've noted, one aspect of this issue that has not been discussed as often is the fact that Brock, a native of Wise County, Virginia, draws much of his culinary inspiration from Appalachia. So Brock's personal and familial history is decidedly Appalachian, not low country, despite his close association with Charleston. Brock grew up in the coal fields of Southwest Virginia and all the men in his immediate family worked in the coal industry. After his father's death, when he was a child, Brock lived on his grandmother's farm where he developed his interest in cooking and his investment in ingredients provenance. Because they were living in what we would today call a food desert, Brock's family tended to grow most of what they ate. Brock honed his skills as a chef, first in his grandmother's kitchen, before later working in several restaurants and going to culinary school at Johnson & Wales in Charleston. To be clear, I'm not seeking to exonerate Brock of the critiques that I've mentioned. Rather, I want to argue that Appalachia needs to be a part of this important conversation because even for coastal restaurants like Husk, the roots of the so-called new Southern cuisine often stretch back to the mountains. And yet Appalachia remains almost wholly excluded from the conversation. Um, low country food is not Brock's only culinary inspiration and it may not even be his primary one. Brock takes seriously his Appalachian heritage and gives it a lot of credit for his culinary viewpoint. This is clear in an episode entitled Roots of the show, The Mind of a Chef, which follows him for eight episodes of its second season. This episode, the only one of its kind in the series, shows Brock preparing what he calls um, good old fashioned hillbilly food with his mother. Throughout the episode, Brock, his mother, and all the other chefs he meets obsessively trumpet the Cucina Provera or poor cooking of Appalachia. But I'm left wondering, why does Brock relegate his Appalachian identity to a single episode of the mind of a chef? Why might he be reluctant to mention this heritage in other episodes of this or in other media outlets, such as Anthony Bourdain's episode of Parts Unknown devoted to Charleston or the long profile article on Brock published in the New Yorker. Additionally, why is Brock so eager to promote himself and his restaurants as Southern more often than Appalachian? What is it about the South that sells? And what is it about Appalachia that perhaps makes restaurateurs reticent to accept or highlight the mantle Appalachian. One possible answer might simply be that Brock's flagship restaurants began in Charleston and not Appalachia. This though seems too easy because the menus of Brock's restaurants often feature a range of specifically Appalachian ingredients and dishes. For example, Brock is known for greasy beans, leather britches, cathead biscuits, corn pone, 
poe cakes, pickles, preserves, sorghum, poke salad, and soured corn, as much as he is for ingredients and dishes of African and African-American origin, such as red cow peas, okra, collards, hop and john, and goat stew. And yet Appalachia has remained largely absent from this conversation until recently. So are Appalachia's culinary attributes overlooked because the region remains, as Roger Cunningham has argued, a blank space between North and South, a vast perceived nothingness often disregarded by American popular culture. Is Appalachia the South's other, the other's other? And does this sense of double alterity change the way Appalachian cuisine is perceived even within the Southeast? In practical terms, does a chef like Brock, along with his agents, publicists, and producers, shy away from the label Appalachian because nationally and globally, it still carries a certain taint? In other words, Southern food may generally be regarded as hip, while Appalachian food is either unknown and thus forgotten, or is reviled due to lingering stereotypes of the region as being poor, backward, and unsophisticated. Even a recent Washington Post article hailing Appalachian food as the next big thing suggests that it is only the humble iteration of the region that could be a hot new trend. When lauded, Appalachian food is described using condescending rhetoric, simple, homegrown, honest, traditional, humble food, as opposed to the sophisticated, cutting edge, innovative, cerebral, artistic, risky, revolutionary, molecular gastronomic haute cuisine typically associated with food in top restaurants. So why does Appalachian food, supposedly the next big thing, have to be humble why can't sophisticated Appalachia be the next big thing? Um, I'm gonna go back for one second. Um, so in an interview for Garden and Gun in September of 2019, Brock proclaimed that his focus is now on Appalachia for two new restaurants that he's planning um, to start in Nashville. He states, quote, one of the reasons I'm focusing on Appalachia is that's what's in my DNA. What my goal is to do for Appalachia, what I've tried to do with the low country, immerse myself into researching and working on an obsessive level to help bring back a lot of these Appalachian varietals of animals and plants and traditions that are at risk of disappearing. The reason for this could be purely personal, a matter of DNA, as he says. It could, however, be the result of his immense success. Brock is now free to pursue interests such as Appalachian cuisine that are less appealing to a broad audience. His motivation could also be to move away from the controversies that have surrounded him in the South Carolina low country. The obsessive research that Brock plans to do in Appalachia will be less likely to be considered cultural appropriation, especially when he can fall back on his claims to be an insider and to be authentic in Appalachia. Plus, in the American imagination, Appalachia is perceived to be largely white. So Brock may hope that race will not enter the conversation about revitalizing heritage in the way that it inevitably did in the low country. So um, going forward, I'd like to explore the idea that there are many wellsprings of regional food. While I'm attendant to the fact that the African-American South is one wellspring and undoubtedly the deepest, Southern Appalachia is another with a myriad of influences which also include African-American cuisine as well as Native American, Scotch-Irish, English, German, Hungarian, and Italian. In conclusion, I'd like to consider whether Sean Brock's restaurants whether we love them or hate them can provide an opportunity to open up more dialogue between the coastal South and the mountain South. Okay, so I am going to now turn it over to Dr. Martel. Thank you so much, Dr. Vernon and hello everyone. So I'm going to share my screen and see if I can manage to pick up that 
um, dazzling slideshow. All right, I'm just going to make y'all a little bit bigger so I can see some faces while I'm talking. And is everyone seeing a PowerPoint slide? Hopefully, hooray. Um, I'm just gonna. Hmm. Sorry, y'all, just getting it together. Let's try this. Got it. So I'm Dr. Jessica Martell, and I'm Assistant Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies here at Appalachian State University. And I want to thank everyone who invited me and everyone who is here to listen to me kind of continue our presentation of contested foodways. Um, so I'm going to, I'm here to unhumble Appalachia in two ways. First, I want to talk about its really fascinating and diverse food history and also um, talk about some really innovative progressive food activism that is always been at the core of, I think, rural Appalachian community identity and is really enjoying an incredible moment um, post pandemic right now, and especially in the Boone area. So my, I'm a scholar of literature, food and the environment, and my research profile um, focuses on the historic foodways of Britain and colonies like Ireland. So that's really my specialty, but I've always found ways over the years to try and connect um, the, this work to the communities and the environments that I live in. I'm always trying to connect what I'm thinking to what I'm doing. And that's really what I'm gonna talk to y'all about tonight. So when I moved to the high country in 2016, an Appalachian State colleague um, directed me to join the board of directors for Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture, um, which is a, a woman-led Boone-based nonprofit. And um, my work has continued. I'm just going to quickly show you. So this is the name of the organization and I'm gonna be referring to it as Burwia, B-R-W-I-A. So it's sometimes a little bit hard to tell that apart from Berwea, like Berwea College in Kentucky. So when I say Berwea, I am referring referring to Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and my service to this organization has been really important. We have a three part mission statement in this nonprofit um, to um, build capacity of the local food system by increasing consumer demand, providing farmer and producer support and increasing access to local food. So over the years I've been promoted and I'm actually this year the board chair and I've seen the organization grow and change over the years, especially last year during the pandemic. And I think for me, Berwea's work really epitomizes something wonderful about Appalachian foodways and food work. And so I wanted to bring that to a community audience um, in a talk like tonight. So I'm gonna draw on a combination of my foodways research and service to Berwea as I continue our presentation about contested foodways. And I just wanna hearken back to Brock's comments, excuse me for flipping back for a second here in Zach's penultimate slide. There's this note or tone in, in this quote, and this is from an article in 2019, the idea that he's going to do for Appalachia what he's done to the low country, doing all of this researching and work on bringing back Appalachian varietals of animals and plants and traditions that are at risk of disappearing. This kind of passage in 2019 is actually, I don't know how many of y'all here have seen the chef's table episode that came out in season six last year with Sean Brock in it. Um, I'm just gonna quickly pop over to a screenshot I took of the description that Netflix has to his, his episode. Um, obsessive, perfectionist, excuse me, I just have to move the zoom window, workaholic, Sean Brock's dedication to reviving lost flavors, reinvigorated Southern cuisine and nearly destroyed him. I just wanna say before I turn to Brock that the episode that is, I also accidentally captured in my screenshot on Asma Khan is a wonderful episode and the perfect illustration of the kind of restaurant work that is possible to elevate women into positions of power, to approach food and food work collaboratively and to help um, vulnerable communities through food. I really highly recommend Asma Khan's episode. <laughs> so if you haven't seen it, um, definitely check it out. She's a really inspirational figure and I just adore um, hearing about her work and that episode is really good. Um, but back to Brock and this narrative of him being this um, you know, kind of reinvigorator that cashes himself out in pursuit of saving Southern foodways is something that I am here to declare is unnecessary. I don't really believe in this one man savior complex. I really think that Brock should lighten up and not be so anxious. And the reason why I say that is because a communal, multifaceted, diversely composed endeavor to preserve and adapt Southern food 
and Appalachian food has been underway for decades and has accelerated in the last few years with the pandemic providing an extra bump of enthusiasm for locally sourced ingredients in some areas, especially ones like those in the high country here in Boone. Um, scholars, farmers, chefs, historians, writers, entrepreneurs, and other community actors all approach food work differently. Families, women, indigenous tribes, and peoples, peoples of color continue to preserve and pass on heritage and histories sharing their stories with new young audiences and advocating for food justice as our systems get reformed from the ground up. Just to give you a very short list of nonprofits and state funded organizations in the state of North Carolina who are doing work to save Southern foodways, <laughs> um, CEFS, CFSA, CFS, C-O-R-E, which stands for Committee for Racial Equity in the Food System. Um, all of these organizations are instrumental in preserving um, foodways and farmways and modernizing them and helping them adapt in a climate of hostile um, industrial corporatization in our, um, in our state. And food councils all over North Carolina, including the Watauga Food Council, have popped up to respond to growing needs for food justice. Our agricultural extension officers um, are increasingly interested in organic and sustainable methods for farming and gardening. And all of this work is being done and has been done over decades. We're just seeing it really come to fruition now. Um, scholars, of course, since we're you know, here in a university setting, I have to mention that scholars from all disciplines advance and improve foodways by analyzing data, documenting history and interpreting cultural contributions. And this latter category is really what I'm most familiar with as, as a humanist, I suppose. Um, for example, but I just wanna say for those of you who are maybe interested in what scientists have to say, um, this is a really amazing interdisciplinary conversation that's really vibrant. But a landmark study in 2011, if you haven't heard of this, um, this is by ethnobotanist Gary Nabahan and environmental anthropologist Jim Vedado declared South Central Appalachia the nation's most diverse food shed. And, um, and Jim Vedado and, and Gary Nabahan have both visited Appalachian State and have really expanded our community and our food knowledge here on campus. And I'm grateful to both of them for being here um, in the early kind of phase of my career at Appalachian. Um, Vedado in particular is a wonderful writer who captures the spirit of, of foodways in the region. He says, people in Appalachia are just crazy about plants and animals. I have never ceased to be amazed by their knowledge and love of all things green and growing, whether they save seeds, graft fruit trees, dig roots and bulbs, can foods, harvest wild plants, hunt game, or raise heritage livestock breeds. It is a truism that older people and a growing smattering of younger people across the region have immense and impressive wild crafting and agricultural skills. In other words, all of these living arts are alive and well. And just to bring it home, I wanna quote Appalachian author, Ronnie Lundy, who writes, even back at a 2008 conference that she showed up at, it's kind of a state of the field conference um, on Appalachian food. She writes, I already knew that we weren't talking about a dying anything. In other words, this narrative that something is dead and needs to be resurrected, resurrected by a man is really something that is best left to other kinds of stories and really doesn't reflect the food history, both in the past and the history being made in the present today. So I just wanna to turn to Ronnie's work. Hold on. I just wanna to turn to Ronnie's work here. Um, her book, Vittles, um, has made her a, dec a decorated food historian. I don't know how many of you have seen this book, um, but I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful creation. And it won the James Beard Award for best US cookbook in 2017, which for those of you who are unfamiliar with that um, accolade, it's kind of like the best picture Oscar for cookbooks. Um, so the secret in other words is out and it's actually been out for a really long time. Um, to me, I think rather than this being a sort of death that needs resurrecting, this is a moment of real hope for me. It's a hopeful conjuncture. We have so much interest in local foodways. We have a lot of momentum. We have a lot of energy. And most importantly, we have a lot of sharing of methods, of knowledge, of techniques, of innovations, of insights, and of cultural traditions. And that's what makes this work so important. It's a collective effort. And that's the key to survival. And that's why Appalachian foodways are. Um, enjoying this renaissance and have nothing but positive um, directions to go. It's the key to survival. We don't need platforming a few. We really, in order to have lasting impact, we need to share with all. And so that's kind of my direction and where I'm coming from. And I've been inspired by Lundy's work. Um, in fact, she is 
Uh, I'm going to turn to her work now to explore the deep wellspring for regional cuisine that Zach mentioned in an earlier part of this presentation, because her work testifies to the myriad composition of cultural influences and cross currents in Appalachian foodways. She was the keynote speaker at the 2017 uh, Food Summit, which was co hosted by Appalachian State and Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture in which I co-organized, and here we are way back then. Um, this is me and Ronnie and Chef Shelley Cooper, who also joined us. By the way, I should mention that um, Ronnie was one of the women who called for John T. Edge's resignation from the SFA um, editorship and, or directorship, excuse me. Um, and it was really her, one of her Facebook posts that kind of kicked off that call for him. She's always been a really fierce advocate for uh, recentering women in histories of food and foodways, particularly in Appalachia, which is where she's from. She's originally from Corbin, Kentucky, and now lives down the road, uh, I think in Burnsville, North Carolina. So her book, Vittles, um, chronicles the impact of, for instance, Cherokee and Appalachian heritage foodways and, uh, and points to its living presence in Appalachian dishes from corn to kushaw, even while recognizing the traumatic history of relocation that inflects each recipe that she provides. Um, so to give you some examples from her book and just to testify to the incredible diversity, um, which is maybe hidden from public view to some extent, um, but is very much alive and well in Appalachian recipes, I want to turn to a couple of examples that she provides. Um, first, that the Cherokee, maybe most obviously, um, introduced settlers to breaking down corn to make nutrients bioavailable, a process that still undergirds every skillet cornbread that gets pulled warm and crispy out of every oven. Um, the very first African-American cookbook ever published in 1866 was by Melinda Russell, a free black uh, Appalachian woman from East Tennessee. And her book, A Domestic Cookbook Containing a Careful Selection of Useful Receipts for the Kitchen, may also be the first published Appalachian cookbook as well, which is a really interesting conjuncture um, that I think is really bears some more study and, um, and attention. And, and Russell's recipes collected from her boarding house and from her pastry shop feature dishes that are still really commonly associated with mountain foodways like molasses custard, chow chow, green tomato preserves and salt rising bread. And the latter of which I have not been able to master even during the pandemic. So I'm still really have some bread goals to achieve. And if anyone can help me with my salt rising bread, please let me know in the chat. <laughs> Um, but Lonnie, and actually salt is another part of, Ron, of, of Ronnie's book that I found extremely fascinating and surprising. Um, she has a whole chapter on salt and she and others have argued that salt is actually the, one of the first, if not the first extractive industry to kind of devastate the ecosystem of Appalachia back in the 19th century. Um, salt veins like those near Saltville, Virginia are a common geological feature of Appalachia and I did not know that. Um, but actually it has sort of historically salt veins have marked plentiful hunting and curing grounds for Native Americans who are hunting for deer. And even long before them, if we cast our imagination geologically back in time, um, also attracted mammoth herds and mastodons and musk ox and giant sloths, fossils of which have been excavated from archeological digs all up and down the mountain uh, region. So, you know, but it also has a problematic history too. Um, you know, while it's common to assume that since big agricultural plantations weren't really established in the mountains that slavery didn't really exist here, it's completely false. And actually many slaves were leased and hired in the region and many of them worked in the salt mines of Appalachia. Um, <clears throat> and actually their, their labor sort of grew the salt industry to a point where in post bellum years, the salt industry expanded so much due to the demand and I think the sort of maybe uh, simultaneous explosion of the stockyards in Chicago, of course, where there's meat, there's curing and salt. And so um, the, the, the Appalachian salt industry expanded exponentially as, as Chicago did as well, fueling in turn the growth of timber and coal mining operations to fuel those dehydrators, those giant dehydrators, which were sending salt to Chicago. Um, so in other words, there's a really important connection between the big industries of Chicago and Appalachia. Um, you know, the Appalachia is in fact, has always been an industry or, you know, an engine of industry of prosperity and development and also great stratification. Um, and I think that history is sometimes really left out we, when we understand Appalachia as sort of humble, food. Um, actually, it's industrial food as well. And um, 
you know, and I think for me, when, you know, after learning about this history, particularly of salt, I see echoes of forced labor and ecological destruction in every tang of country ham and, and the salt of greens and beans and pickles. Um, you know, it's why we have so many pickles in Appalachian cuisine and even on watermelon served with a sprinkle of salt um, kind of, you know, now sort of conjures this history for me. Um, but, you know, I also wanted to mention that there are some really exciting new possibilities um, on the horizon for Appalachian salt makers. One, um, JQ Dickinson Salt Works in Malden, West Virginia, um, has, the have, has adopted the practice of saving the magnesium rich liquid leftovers from salt harvesting to make nigari, um, which is used in a Japanese practice of coagulating soy milk to make tofu or fermenting cow's milk to make fresh ricotta. So there's this great kind of borrowing of a Japanese tradition to um, make new kinds of products in Appalachia. And I love global cross currents like this that draw on the history of the region, but then sort of look forward to um, different kinds of, of really wide ranging collaborative possibilities in, in Appalachian foodways. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the Scotch Irish and German immigrant communities um, who brought their foodways down the spine of the mountains as they migrated south from Pennsylvania along the wilderness roads. You know, in Cherokee corn, um, and I've talked about this in other contexts, but Cherokee corn in Irish hands becomes pachin, which is the Gaelic word for moonshine. The Irish also brought their kale and potatoes, which flourished in our cold climates and rocky soils. Um, Appalachians are obviously really serious about beans, and many aficionados of greasy beans might be surprised to learn that the process of drying beans by threading them uh, into these bristly hanging ribbons actually may have been imported from Germany um, in the mountainous regions there and German archives back from the 14th century record this exact um, drying process that and we, we sort of speculate that that actually might be the, the origin stories for many of the ways in which Appalachians treat beans. Um, so Lundy, among other historians of this region, has really been instrumental and inspirational to people like me in expanding public perceptions of Appalachian cuisine. You know, if it is still known and is at least, you know, perceived by media outlets, national media outlets like The Post and The Times and others as this kind of source of inspiring cucina povera, um, I think it's also really important to continue to speak up for its other associations, that we need to recognize that Appalachia as a central path for global migration, um, a central role that it played in big industries like the stockyards of Chicago in the Midwest, and its astounding biodiversity. Um, and it, this, all of these kind of new insights really helps us revise our narrow understanding of Appalachia's contribution to a broadly and diversely composed national food history. I just want to quickly mention before I pivot to talking more about food activism in the region that Ronnie is talking with Padma Lakshmi and Tony Tipton Martin next Tuesday. Um, if you, uh, and I can actually try and find the URL and drop it in the chat if anyone's interested, but they're talking at the Aspen Words Festival next Tuesday. It's a $10 ticket and they're, I think they're talking about autobiography. I didn't even look, I just signed up. So very excited to see those three women talking about food writing together in the same forum. So, um, well, I was supposed to have a blank slide there, but um, so yeah, I want to transition to talking about the contributions of Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture, which is a very local organization that has its own part to play in Appalachia's ongoing dynamic food story. Um, and Berwia is really important for me to bring to an Appalachian state audience, um, and particularly to alumni, because Berwia itself is a product of the Appalachian State University campus um, and the scholarly communities that exist there. It originated 15 years ago in the Center for Appalachian Studies. Um, a group of women took one of then Pat, uh, director Pat Beaver's seminars on Appalachian activism and decided to start farming as a way of opting out of corporate food models and kind of finding their own way of doing some environmental activism. And so the story as I've recorded it from our founding mothers, the founding members of Berwia way back, uh, was that they went around and asked for advice from local farmers and they found that they didn't really feel like they were being taken seriously from especially predominantly male farmers who often declared that farming wasn't women's work and really like didn't think they could do it. And so um, Berwia grew from a resistance to that <laughs> and a reassertion of female agency in the rural space and um, a kind of reassertion of, of, you know, women's capacity for actually doing land, you know, working the land and laboring. And it grew from knowledge sharing potlucks to what is now a fully staffed 501c3 
um, that it is today. And what's important to me about Berwia also is that it foregrounds women's contribution to agriculture in its history and in its programs now. And it also provides unique leadership spaces for women that don't exist in many other places. Um, for instance, this is a picture of our board and staff. We had a January retreat and this was us after being on Zoom for four hours. So we were very excited to be almost done with that call. Um, but we have done so many things, it's hard for me to even condense it, but just to highlight some of our recent achievements over the, the next few years, we have started new farmers markets that didn't exist to give producers more access um, to, to customers. The King Street Market, the Boone Winter Market, and the High Country Food Hub among them. Um, we've also, you know, programmed and provided community building opportunities from the High Country Farm Tour to the Let Us Learn Community Gardens. And most relevant to our presentation today, um, and to sort of I will get back to Brock maybe a little bit at the end, but um, just to say that our leadership in coordinating the Watauga and Ash County Seed Libraries a few years ago is really inspirational to me. And both of those, we, we reclaimed little card catalogs and filled them with seeds that the community members and invited the community to collect and save and bring in seeds from their own heritage crops and their family traditions. And we collected a lot of stories to go along with those seeds. And um, I can't actually believe that I'm able to show you this, but after several false starts, we grew some of the um, really rare kind of native glass corn. And uh, <laughs> we've done this for the last couple of years. So we have a few, but this corn is sort of a couple of generations away from the seed library after some false starts. Um, but it's really kind of inspirational to think about the ways in which our heritage foodways also in encourages us to um, collect stories from, from the community as well and kind of preserve some of the, the history behind some of the foods that we eat, even though that corn is obviously ornamental. Or I guess, it, anyway, I suppose I could actually work it up to something, um, but it's so pretty to look at. Um, so just to kind of uh, sum up, you know, our pandemic year was a really big year. Um, we kept over 850,000 local food dollars in the high country community and in the economy. And all of that went to pockets um, of farmers who share our organization's vision of sustainability and equity. And, equity. Um, and all of our farmers are really dedicated to paying tribute to the past by preserving farmland and farming methods and knowledge sharing. Um, and also, you know, we're, we're helping them be poised to um, address future demands as Boone and adjacent communities grow because they will continue to grow. Um, we also provided 14, oh, excuse me, over $40,000 in supplemental nutritional benefits that doubled snack and WIC, uh, SNAP and WIC benefits for local women and families at all of our local farmers markets. So they had access to affordable local food too. And all of the numbers you know, here really reflect the contributions we've made to stabilize the local economy during an unprecedented event. And what's really critical for me to point out as I sort of transition away from this is just to say that the stability that Berwia has provided in our local community began in the laboratory of the Appalachian State University classroom. And that kind of community campus partnership and that sort of mutual exchange between academic and, and activist networks is really so incredibly critical for continuing to build capacity um, and continuing to provide prosperity to our community. And so to, to, to kind of double back to Sean Brock at the end, um, Last month, actually, Berwia hosted a talk on corporate food colonialism um, by Dr. Ricardo Salvador. He came to visit us from the Union of Concerned Scientists, and he's there. He's an agronomist and their director of the Food and Environment Program. And so I learned a lot from him, but one comment really stood out to me, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, essentially, <laughs> everyone who works on food knows that the U.S. food system is broken and we need a new one. Um, Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture has been doing innovative alternative food systems work for many years without support, without investment, without recognition. But organizations like yours are really the pioneers and what we need. Um, we need your data. Your data is valuable. We need to know about your experiments. We need your stories. We need your histories um, because you guys are underwriting new models that really need, uh, that are really needed on a national scale to really reform and to create a just system for all um, that's environmentally just and just to people as well. And so while I admire many aspects of Brock's work, um, especially his dedication to preserving heritage, flora and fauna, um, I invite him and other people like him with deep pockets to step off the celebrity platform and silently partner with nonprofits, 
collectives, cooperatives, and campus community partnerships who have already been working for years and decades to do this work. Um, and just to name a few more in our region, <laughs> since I'm at it, um, ASAP and Appalachian Grown, resourceful communities out of Johnson City and Berwia are a few uh, organizations that work here that are doing incredible food systems work, and it all needs more support kind of now more than ever. So just to close, I wanted to invite you to look forward to an upcoming event that we have planned for Berwia. In April, we are planning an upcoming farm to table dinner at Boonshine Brewery. And this is our Instagram page. So if you wanna follow us on Instagram, um, here you go. But Boonshine is an example of a local thriving business that is really interested in local sourcing and really reflects a growing demand of consumers who want to kind of participate in local foodways and can help preserve local foodways in the future. And Boonshine has been super supportive of Berwia and they have, I'm very excited to announce, um, they've started working for us in this way by brewing a local beet-based beer for Berwia, which we're calling, I think, Beer Wea, or at least that's my vote. <laughs> um, it went into the vat on Monday the 8th uh, on International Women's Day, and we're hoping that it's ready in early April for our farm to table dinner. So keep a lookout for it. Um, but these are the little moments that really recharge my social batteries and reflect really exciting collaborations between campus and community, but also connections between Appalachia's rich kind of past and, um, and its really promising future when it comes to foodways. All right, I think that's probably enough for y'all. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we can open it up to comments and questions. I think Zach and I can both um, wield this hopefully. So please feel free to either unmute yourself and talk or use the chat function, we'd be happy to. So I thought the glass gym corn was a popping corn, is it not? Or at least I've had seeds one time that I tried to grow that it was supposedly a popping corn. Maybe there's different varietals of that. Ellen, we have thrown it in, in a fire pit and it does pop. So is it edible? I guess is the question. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's a good question. I'm sure someone here might might know, but um, we'll have to try it and see what happens. I know you can nixtamatize it and eat it. So it should be edible in some form. Can step in if uh, nobody else has a question. Um, thank you. Really enjoyed uh, both uh, Jess and Zach your presentations. Quick uh, questions, which might have a, a more evolving answer. But Zach, in terms of uh, white and black um, food traditions, you know, both have a fluid history, and both also have a history of um, constant cultural um, interchanges. So how does the critique in a way also ossify a certain black heritage? In a, in a way, is the critique itself also detrimental to a more um, fluid and uh, to a non-essentialist view of black culture? So that's my question for Zach and for Jess. What I'm thinking is uh, really fascinating, but I'm thinking also about uh, all the arguments around the feminization of agriculture that black farmers were you know, asked to leave the land and you had white farmers coming in and then the consequent shift to a feminization of agriculture where because women were uh, doing agriculture, they were being paid less, uh, you know, sort of agriculture stepping down in terms of price and the value of a product. How does Blue Ridge Women in Agriculture deal with the racial history of agriculture? So, you know, and however you want to address. Great, Zach, do you wanna go first? Um, yeah, I, I mean, that's a great question, Sushmita. Um, I mean, I guess I would say, you know, when you're trying to right these big historical wrongs in this case, um, white chefs who have all too often taken credit for culinary traditions that have their roots um, in, in African and African-American cultures, I would say the first step in righting those wrongs is to start giving credit where credit is due. Um, and then I think once you've established that, um, then you can do, I think, the much more complex and nuanced work that you're talking about, where you think about cross-pollination of white and African-American culinary traditions, um, but also all of these other culinary traditions that we're talking about as well. Um, like, I think Michael Twitty is a really interesting example of this, um, and he comes to mind. 
um, because he has this really fantastic book, um, The Cooking Gene, um, which also I think won the James Beard Award um, a few years ago. But he is African-American and Jewish. And so he writes a lot about his dual interests in these two culinary traditions and the ways in which they overlap in many ways. So yeah, I think giving credit where credit is due first and sort of taking away the um, some of the unearned celebrity from white chefs might be, I think, the first step um, and acknowledging um, where credit should be given, but then the next step can be, you know, sort of thinking in more complex ways um, so that we don't end up essentializing, you know, any group. Thank you. Yeah, Sushmita, I really appreciate that question. And it's um, an active conversation, particularly in the last year in the wake of the summer um, protests, although it's always been obviously a topic that um, we're, we're trying to deal with. But I think that one of the ways in which we're um, moving forward, trying to understand how race kind of becomes part of an intersectional conversation around land, land ownership, and labor um, is um, we're seeking out grant funding to develop those kinds of um, advocacy programs and, and programming for our community to educate about why advocacy is necessary. Um, or also, uh, I think it's really important to you know, continue to train and educate our staff about the history of, of land use. You know, um, I suppose I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this uh, elegantly, but I think one of the barriers to that kind of intersectional thinking is the sort of assumed whiteness of Appalachia as a region. And it's very, it sometimes almost has to be something that we recenter or we have to almost decolonize our thinking about our own place in our own region in order to really understand that gender is only one, you know, uh, like axis upon which we discuss liberation. And, um, and so as an organization, we've really had to um, really like specifically seek out grants, um, training and education for our staff and our board. And we continue to do that. And it's definitely forefront on our agenda. Um, uh, for, for 2021, we're, we're definitely trying to do that. We're looking at ways in which we can recompose and, and you know, our own communities and the communities that we serve as well. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely an imaginative um, challenge because I think it's, it's so easy to internalize stereotypes about Appalachia and, um, and whitewash our own region, even as we know and are aware of and educate ourselves about its diversity and its diverse history. Um, but extremely important to point out that, you know, once you, once you understand your program, especially in the nonprofit world as liberatory, then you need to make sure that that is a, a vision that expands to include everyone. <laughs> so really great, great point and definitely a work in progress. Thank you. Really, really uh, inspiring presentations by both of you. Thank you. Other questions and comments? I just want to plug, because um, Jess ended the presentation with this, this list of really great um, local organizations that are working on food justice. Um, I'd be remiss if we didn't mention um, Farm Cafe here, because um, Farm Cafe is doing really amazing work. Um, uh, both during the pandemic, but for years before that to address food insecurity in the region and they're feeding um, hundreds and hundreds of people every week who otherwise might be going hungry, um, both in the cafe, but also in um, the programs that they have to save food from different grocery stores and farmers markets and then redistribute it to people in need. Um, so it is an incredibly unique organization um, until I think last year, it was the only nonprofit restaurant in the state of North Carolina. Um, Raleigh now has a similar um, restaurant that is um, I think modeled in part on Farm Cafe, but um, Boone is such an interesting town. I mean, cause we have Berwia that's doing this amazing revolutionary feminist work in the farming sector. And then we have Farm Cafe that's doing really amazing work um, uh, for food justice in the restaurant sector. And actually, if I could piggyback on that, Zach just reminded me of um, 
and thank you, Joseph, for your comment. I think interdisciplinarily, and I usually have that hat on. And sometimes I think when I get focused on our nonprofit work, it's I silo myself a little bit. And so thank you for bringing up the work that Farm does, um, particularly in reclaiming food and um, and repurposing perfectly edible, perfectly nutritious food um, that would have otherwise gone to the landfill and continue to warm our our planet and our climate. Um, I also want to mention that one of the great advances in the high country in the last few years has been the development and flourishing of the Watauga Food Council. Um, and the pandemic has fragment, I think the other reason why um, I appreciate you reminding me that I am part of a really wide community of food activists here is um, that I think that there are so many nonprofits, um, uh, Hunger and Health Coalition and Hospitality House and other people who are doing that wonderful work in the community um, that are also intersects with, with some of our concerns and farm cafes concerns. At times we have so much nonprofit activity that one of the things that was missing until recently was a coordinating body to kind of uh, promote a little bit of efficiency and, and workflow between these different groups and making sure that we're all working together to provide a kind of optimal <laughs> food reform, food system reform. And so the Watauga Food Council has been really helpful at um, not only, I think, streamlining and coordinating nonprofits and getting them talking to each other, um, but also providing educational and training opportunities in, especially around um, issues of food justice and food accents in this community. So I have to plug them as well. And um, you know, their work that they do reflects, um, you know, Carolina Farm Stewardship Association, um, community food systems, and other nonprofits across the state that are also trying to use food councils to coordinate, again, sort of as we go up the scale, um, we all need to be working together if we're all working on the same purpose and uh, we serve more people that way. So those um, coordination efforts are also equally important to, to the maybe more ground level work and the day-to-day -day stuff that we do in Farm Cafe and and the other organizations I mentioned locally. Um, well, I'm gonna thank everybody for joining us tonight and thank you to um, Drs. Martel and Vernon for being here and giving such great talks. And um, I love these because I learned so much <laughs> and all I have to do is sit and watch and that's, that's a nice thing. <laughs> Um, I want to plug our April 20th, that's our next Zoomer, and um, I think Ellen has put that in the chat, so um, I hope you'll um, take, a, take a chance to look at that and maybe register for that one for the next time. Um, anyway, I hope you all have a great evening, and thank you for joining us. Good night. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. <laughs>